As we open God's word together, let's open it together with prayer. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the privilege of knowing your truth. We ask that you would open your word to us and lead us and guide us. Speak to our hearts and speak to us hope, Lord, that we might have a hope to rest our hearts on. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you have been attending Serpentine Prophecy? All right. If you haven't been coming, talk to somebody who's just raised their hand, and you'll find out that it is an extraordinary program. We have two more nights. Don't worry. He hasn't gotten to room 217 yet, so you can still show up. In Serpentine Prophecy, they're talking about uh, the most, one of the most haunted places in the United States, the Stanley Hotel, right around Halloween, looking at ghosts. What are they? Where do they come from? And you know, I find that uh, Halloween, a holiday that celebrates all that is dark and evil, it's been called the devil's holiday. Few Christians stop to think to themselves, what is the true history of Halloween? So I'd like to start this morning by sharing with you a little bit about the ghostly past or uh, history to Halloween. It can be traced all the way back to the ancient Celts in Ireland. October 31 was when they celebrated the end of the har harvest and it was called Samhain. In the Celtic calendar, it marked the ending of one year and the beginning of a new year. But the Celts believed at this time of year, the veil between the physical world that we live in and the ghostly spiritual world was its thinnest. And so those who had died, whether they be long gone ancestors or recently dead relatives, could pass between that thin veil and actually communicate with the uh, Celts there in Ireland. So October 31 became the day when the dead communicated with the living. So on this day, many villagers would set out gifts of food or drink and toys for the children that had died. After the harvest work was complete, celebrants joined with Druid priests to light a community fire using a wheel that would cause friction and sparks and flames. And it was a mandatory holiday that lasted three days and three nights. If you didn't participate in Samhain, you were cursed. During this time, many people would dress up as animals so that fairies or spirits or bad things wouldn't come and kidnap, the, kidnap them. And that's where the whole dressing up came from. Well, as the Catholic Church began to spread throughout Europe, it saw this pagan holiday as an opportunity to meld with the local people at that time. And so they came up with a new holiday. Do you know what that holiday was? called All Saints Day, All Saints Day, and uh, that's a long phrase, All Saints Day, so they just called it Hollow Mass, Hollow meaning saint or holy, and Mass uh, meaning the Mass, so the Mass for the saints. This was the day to celebrate the dead, the dead saints. And the day before Hollow Mass was called All Hollows Eve, which turned into Halloween. And that is how we got Halloween. From the, Halloween from ancient time was seen as a day when secrets from the invisible world of ghosts and spirits and even angels was opened up to our world. But the question we have to ask ourselves as Christians, what does the Bible say? And many people want to know. And perhaps those who have been coming to Serpentine Prophecy, that's been a question that's 
been going on in the back of your mind? Do ghosts exist? If so, what are they? What about spirits? Can we receive messages from the underworld? Should we be seeking answers from the dead at all? And perhaps a more important question for your life and mine is, where do we go when we die? Do the dead live in an invisible world that interacts with our world on occasion? So this morning, we're going to look, turn to the Bible and look at this question, and we're going to end with hope. Amen? We're going to end with hope. We start in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 16, verse 14. And if it's on the screen there for you, I'd like to invite you to read it with me. Revelation chapter 16, verse 14. Are you ready? Let's read it together. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now I know, we don't like thinking about dark things. When we drive down the road and we... When I drive down the road and I see my neighbor, not my neighbor here, but my neighbor in Washington, <laughs> have skeletons and witches and whatever, I tell my kids, look the other direction. We don't want to fill our mind with that sort of stuff. But you know, there are things written in the Bible that are for our benefit, not for us to focus on and medi meditate, meditate on, but for us to know. And one of the things that we need to know as Christians is that there is a devil, there are evil angels, and they are especially at work at the end of time. And you know why we need to know that? Because the Bible tells us, Jesus told us, that the devil is a liar and the father of what? The father of lies. How many of you want to uh, believe a lie? How many of you don't want to believe a lie? Absolutely. And the way that you're not going to believe a lie is to know the? Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And so when we look at the end of time, we see that the Bible tells us in Revelation that there are going to be spirits at the end of time that are at work. Now somebody says, how do I know that, um, how do I know if ghosts are real? Well, friends, I want to tell you that the Bible tells us that whatever is being seen out there may actually be real, but it may be something different than what you're thinking it is. I remember when I was a kid, I went and visited my grandparents' house. Now, grandparents, uh, they would have me sleep in this room where they had pictures of all their relatives who were long gone and let me tell you black and white pictures can be really scary to a kid even a teenager I mean you look at these people who had to sit for hours in front of a you know one of those black and white cameras and none of them smile they just they just look at you so I'm laying in bed all alone looking at all these black and white pictures of these people who are long gone staring at me one evening I had an experience I was sleeping and all of a sudden I woke up and the door opened and in walked this woman who I, I didn't know. She was in a white gown all the way to the, to the floor and she had this like green light around her. And I said, who are you? Don't ask me why I talked to it, but I said, who are you? Didn't say a word to me. Walked in, walked right by the foot of my bed and of course, and then walked to the side of my bed, scared me out of my skin, jumped out of bed, ran, flipped on the light, turned around, went to look for her. She was gone. I thought, she must have rolled under the bed. So I went and I pulled up the covers and looked under the bed. She wasn't there. What was it? I went to my grandmother. I said, you wouldn't believe what I just saw, and I'm not sure I want to sleep in that room again. And she said, what was it? And I told her the story. She says, oh, yes, those are just friendly ghosts. But I knew that wasn't a ghost. I knew, but I also knew it was real, whatever it was. So what I did is I took my Bible and I placed it on my chest and I said, Lord, you are my shield and defender. 
I can know that these things are real, but you are stronger. Uh, the Bible says, he who is in you is stronger than he who is in the world. Lord, I place my faith in you, and I know that you are here to protect me. The Bible tells us that at the end of time, there is a spirit world that is going to be contacting our own world, which gives credence to the idea that whatever people are seeing today, it very well may be real. The Bible tells us that there is a place, an invisible world, which at times contacts our own world. Listen to how the New Testament puts it. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, let's read it together. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We got to know that there is a power, an invisible power, a dark power, a satanic power that, it, uh, that is at work to deceive and lead astray every person in this room. And if you are open to it, he may at times appear and converse. Again, we don't like to think about these things, but it is better to know and to meet, meet it in the power of Christ than to plug our ears and say, it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. When I was going to school at Avondale College, you know where Avondale is? Australia. Uh, I got to, for the first time, meet all of the ministerial students that were going to be future pastors. One of the guys who was going through the school he sat down and he said to me, he said, Michael, there's no such thing as the devil. Yeah, I nearly fell over. I said, what are you going to school to be? <laughs> he said, there's no such thing as the devil or evil spirits. Now, I don't know if there was a conference out there in the world that picked him up. Who knows? Uh, I've forgotten his name, otherwise I may tell you. Uh, so you don't ever have, anyways. So, but that's a dangerous thing, you know, to believe, not just as a pastor, but for any Christian to believe that there is no devil, that there's no spirits. When you don't believe it exists, that's when it can come and bite you. So we got to know that there is real things happening in our world and that at the end of time, Satan is active and he's going to be working through spirits to deceive people. And you know, a deception is not a deception unless it's believable. How do you think Satan and these spirits are going to deceive people at the end of time? How will they communicate with people at the end of time? Think about this. If the devil came to a church and said, Hello, my name's Devil. Uh, I would like to invite you to follow me. How many of you would say that's a pretty convincing deception? But if the devil came as somebody you knew and loved from your past and said, hi, I know we haven't seen each other in a long time, but I've been on the other side and I'd like to tell you what I've seen so that you can know how you should live your life today. Let me tell you, if the person sounds like somebody you love and looks like somebody you love and Sm yeah, smells like somebody you love, or it pulls on your heartstrings. We have to believe that there is another world, and some may call it the supernatural. Others say it's the other side. The Celtics believed it was the land of the dead, but the Bible warns all true believers to leave this land alone. Communication with the dead in Scripture is strictly forbidden. And there's a reason. 
Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 14. Whoa. Okay, I'm going to have to read it from here because I need binoculars to read it back there. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the what? The dead. For all who do these things are what? An abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you dispossess listened to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. Would God give us such a strict warning and then send somebody from the dead to speak with us? No. If God tells us not to talk to those who are dead, and then he says to do that is an abomination, and then to say those who did do it were driven out of the land of Canaan because of that very act, for him to then send or allow a relative in heaven to come and speak with us would be for him to contradict himself. But still, these stories happen. My wife went to naturopathic medical school in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and one of her professors said that her mother would leave her dimes, dimes in her shoes, dimes in her drawer. She said once she went to fill a bottle of water at one of those water filling station machines, and as she put her bottle of water down on the station, suddenly dimes began pouring out of the machine. Yeah, I guess so. What was it? For her, she was convinced it was her relative who was trying to communicate with her. I remember hearing this story of a missionary who understood from the scriptures what it says about what happens when you die. And he understood uh, these different things. And somebody said, would you like to see your son again? He said, yes. They said, well, you need to come to such and such a church, and there you'll see your son again, who had died. The missionary showed up at the church, and he was sitting there in the, one of the back rows, and who should come running down the aisle but his son, at least what appeared to be his son. And he said, I knew that it wasn't real. He said, but everything inside of me said, I want it to be real because I miss him so much. He ended up getting up from the service, turning away. He refused to communicate with the entity that ran down to him, and it disappeared and left. Why would God forbid something that seems so innocent? If my child died, why can't I talk to him or her? If my husband died, why can't I contact him or her? Throughout the ages, people have sought for answers in the underworld. But God has always steered us away from this practice because he knows that when we seek to contact the dead, we are contacting something else. Listen to what the Bible says about death. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 5 through 6, it says, For the living, who's the living? Raise your hand if you're living. Okay, that's everyone here. For the living... What do they know? They know that they will die. But the dead know how much? Nothing. Yes, how many of you want to visit a doctor that knows nothing? How many of you want to listen to a pastor who knows nothing? 
we should not communicate with a world where they know nothing. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They, they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy, it is now all perished. Ecclesiastes 9.10, it says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Psalms 115, verse 17, you know, if you go to the typical Christian funeral, they say that once a person dies, they go straight to heaven. What does the Bible say? Can you read it with me? Short verse. Let's read it together. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, if I were to die today and go to heaven, there's one thing I'd be doing. What do you think it'd be, it would be? I'd be praising the Lord. How many of you, if you died and went to heaven today, you'd say, thank you, Lord. I don't have to plow another driveway. <laughs> thank you, Lord, that I don't have to face another battle. Thank you, Lord, that I finally made it. We'd be praising the Lord, and yet the Bible tells us so crystal clear that those who die do not praise the Lord. It's not because they wouldn't praise the Lord. If they could, it's not that, they, they, uh, that they've suddenly lost the ability to praise the Lord. It's because they're not there yet. They're not there yet. When they get there, they're going to praise the Lord, but they're not there yet. In Job chapter 7 and verse 10, speaking about ghosts, if they're not there, are they then floating around here as ghosts? Job 7 verse 10 tells us, he, that's the person who has died, shall what? Never return to his house, nor shall his place know him what? Anymore. Now, that gave me great comfort when I remember that verse, and I was sleeping in my grandmother's room, and in walked this strange appearance. I realized this isn't somebody from those pictures on the wall. This is something else, and whatever it is, I know my heart is safe with Christ. I can call on Him, and He can protect me. Ghosts are not, according to the Bible, ghosts are not the dead returning to the land of the living, to haunt or to share secrets, because the Bible tells us they will never return to their house. In Job chapter 14, verse 21, it says, of the person who has died, his sons come to honor and he does not know it. They are brought low and he does not perceive it. Now, this can be quite comforting, especially if you were to imagine a mother who dies, and let's say, her, let's say she dies, she goes to heaven, she's looking down on her wayward children, and she's seeing all the suffering and all the problems and all the heartache and all that's going through their life. Sorry about that, Lord, bring the clouds, huh? Uh, can you imagine for that mother how much heaven would be heaven if she has to look down and watch all the suffering that's going on down here on earth. I don't know about you, but I find the words of Scripture so much more comforting to know that they know nothing. They don't know the suffering. They don't know the pain. My uh, wife's grandmother, she died right as COVID was beginning, right as the pandemic was beginning. And both of us have thought many times to ourselves, I'm so glad she didn't have to live in isolation for like two or three years, not, you know, having contact with anybody. I mean, it would have driven her nuts. Now, this was a lady who was like 90, I can't remember, 94, 96, but uh, at that age, she would tell us frequently, she, and she was fully, you know, fully had her mental capacity rode her bike to the store, like fully active, she would tell us, today I'm going to go visit the old people. <laughs> so she would go and she would visit many people who were so much younger than her that, uh, and she'd sit there and she'd visit and, and there. And I thought, Grandma, like, 
Don't you realize? Anyways, that lets you know that age is in your mind, right? Age is in your mind. Uh, so, you know, I'm grateful that she knows nothing. I'm grateful that she doesn't know the pain and suffering that's going on in this world. Bible says that she is sleeping, that she, she doesn't know these things that are going on. Psalm 146, verse 4, says, His spirit departs, he returns to his earth, in that very day his plans, what? Perish. Psalm 6, verse 5, For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? Isaiah 38, verse 18, For Sheol, and remember that was the uh, Canaanite name for um, Hades, For Sheol cannot thank you, death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth. You remember Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den? I want to share with you what Daniel had to say. Uh, Daniel, the Bible, uh, or in Daniel, it says that Daniel didn't even go to heaven. In Daniel 12, verse 13, it says, But you, that's Daniel, go your way till the end, for you shall what? You shall stand in your lot or rest and will arise to your inheritance at the what? At the end of days. So that's Daniel. What about King David? Remember King David? The Bible says he hasn't gone to heaven either. In Acts chapter 2, verse 29, uh, it says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Where is David? In the grave. Now, somebody will say, but that's just David's body. King David's body is in the grave, but his spirit is in heaven. But if you go just a few verses further, in verse 34, notice what it says. For, read it with me. For David did not ascend into the heavens. The Bible is clear. And of all the kings of Israel that should have gone to heaven at death, it would have been David, a man after God's own heart. Wouldn't you agree? If somebody was going to be in heaven, it would be King David. He was perhaps the greatest king of Israel. But the Bible tells us he's not in heaven. It's not because he won't be there someday. It's because he's with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And maybe, uh, maybe somebody who's died in your life, and maybe my grandmother and my wife's grandmother, resting in the grave, not knowing anything, until those graves open when Jesus comes. So where do people go when they die? The same place that Daniel and David went when they died. In Job 21, verse 32, it says, Yet he shall be brought to the grave and a vigil kept over the tomb. In Daniel 12, verse 2, it says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And this verse shows us that whether you're righteous or you're wicked, when you die, you go to the same place until the judgment. You remember in Hebrews, it says it is appointed for man to die how many times? Once and then the judgment. Right. So you die once, you go to the grave, whether you're... Uh, Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, or Hitler, or whoever, you go to the grave, you're there, you know nothing until the resurrection. Uh, John chapter 5, verse 28. This is Jesus speaking, and it says, Do not marvel at this, the hour is coming. That means future tense, the hour is coming. How many years had people been dead by the time Jesus said this phrase? About 4,000 years. 4,000 years in the grave, and Jesus says the hour is still yet coming, meaning that people hadn't gone anywhere for, from 4,000 years ago when they died until Jesus. They hadn't gone anywhere. They were still in their graves. Jesus says the hour is coming 
in which how many? Go ahead and put the verse on the screen if possible. Okay, the hour is coming in which what? All who are in the graves will what? Hear his voice. And verse 29 says, and some will rise to everlasting life and some will rise to destruction, shame and contempt. Beloved, I want you to know today that on Hollow's Eve, it's not the spirits of those who have died that come to visit people, for the Bible says the dead know nothing. They cannot praise God and they cannot speak to you and to me because according to the Bible, the dead are not floating around as conscious ghosts or spirits. Where does the Bible say all the dead are? In the grave. Isn't it interesting in Daniel 12 too, it says all that sleep in the dust shall awake. Did you know the Bible gives us a way to understand death? And this is how it helps us. The Bible tells us that death is just like a sleep. How many of you had a good sleep last night? Okay. How many of you had a terrible sleep last night? Okay. I sympathize with you. Uh, sometimes, you know, we wake up surprised going, I don't know what changed, but last night was great. And then other times we go, I don't know what happened, but last night was terrible. Um, but you know, no matter how long you sleep, how much do you know when you have a good sleep? Yeah, <laughs> you don't know anything. Um, you don't know when you're sleeping. Do you know the time on your alarm clock when you're asleep? No. Are you aware of the fans spinning above your head when you're asleep? No. No. Or your pet cat who silently walked into the room. You know, my, f my family and I, we lived in a RV for many years. And we lived up in the mountains in an RV. And they had these rats called mountain rats. And one night, we all went to bed. My children, uh, at that point, slept in sleeping bags on the floor. We all had a wonderful sleep. You know, the window cracked open, fresh mountain air coming in. We didn't hear a thing until we woke up in the morning and we saw that a mountain rat had jumped up on our kitchen countertop in the middle of the night, pulled a tomato out of our basket, pulled it onto the kitchen floor, up the steps, and for some reason decided to pull that tomato right to the foot of our bed. I think he was mocking me. And he ate half that tomato right at the foot of the bed. And I didn't know a thing. I wish I'd known a thing. After that, we began finding other things. We found that he was crawling into our drawers, eating my wife's spatulas and wooden spoons. Like, she'd pull it out and look at me like I was guilty. I'd say, I didn't do that. So one night... We were sitting there, like really quiet, and we thought to ourselves, we're going to catch this rat. So we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. Oh, I, I have to tell you, I put out a trap, because I didn't know it was a rat at that time. I thought it was a mouse. So we put out a little trap with peanut butter, and we're sitting there like, you know when you're laying in bed with your eyes wide open, you're just waiting for something to happen? So we're sitting there, we're waiting, we're waiting. I'm just about falling asleep when I hear a whack. I get up and I say, Delany, I think we got him. So we both quietly go down the steps with the flashlight and we had pulled out the bottom drawer in the kitchen. We're shining the flashlight in there and there the rat is with the trap smashed on his nose. <laughs> and he's just sitting there looking around. And I said, that wasn't a mouse, that's a rat. We need a bigger trap. So... He sat there for a little bit stunned, and then he shook his head, the trap fell off, and then I watched him go back to it and start licking the peanut butter off the trap. <laughs> he said, useless trap. So the next night, I got a bigger trap, and, uh, and I was looking for him, I was looking for him, I set the trap, there was no, there was no rat, I set the trap, I turned around, 
I just crawl into bed to pull the sheets up and I hear a whack. And I said, no way. He was waiting for me to leave the kitchen to get the peanut butter. I went back there. We got him that time. No more mountain rat. But the point I remember from the story is that you don't even know a rat eating at the foot of your bed when you're asleep. And if Jesus would compare sleep to death, that's what it's like to die. In John chapter 11, verses 11 uh, through 14, Jesus said these things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is what? Is dead. Uh, you find this idea even in the Old Testament. In 2 Samuel 7, 12, it says, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. If you go through the Old Testament, you find that all the kings, it says, they slept with their fathers. Now, we're not expecting to find a giant bed filled with Israelite kings, are we? No, it means that they all died. But even in the Old Testament, it refers death to a sleep. Why? Because God is so kind, He wants you and I to understand what happens when you die. And He gives us the closest thing to relate with death that we could understand, and that is sleep. In sleep, you know nothing. You close your eyes, but eventually, everyone wakes up. In 1 Thessalonians chapter, well, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 52. It says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all, what? Sleep, but we shall all be, what? Changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. I can't wait for that day when some of my friends who have died and now sleep in their graves, God will come and wake them up. I can't wait for that day when the trumpet of God sounds and when Jesus comes again and the angels are there with Him. And as 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and then the dead in Christ will rise first. Amen. Then we'll be brought past to the, the saying in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? But until the coming of Jesus, friends, the Bible is clear that all who die sleep in their graves. We cannot communicate with the dead because the dead cannot communicate with us. Make sense? They're asleep. A sleep in which they are not conscious or aware. They're sleeping in the dust of the ground. And someday, friends, God will ri raise them up. So if ghosts and spirits are real, and they are, and we know from our readings that ghosts and spirits are not the dead coming back to pay us a visit, who are they? Ephesians 6, verse 12. We read this verse once. Let's read it again. Are you ready? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Satan wants you to believe your experience over the Word of God. And so he's going to give you an experience you know, Revelation 13 says that, it, that the beast power even makes fire come down from heaven uh, on the side of men on the earth. Now, let me tell you, if you have a charismatic preacher who says, you want to know that I'm really from God? Watch this. Just like Elijah called fire from heaven, so will I. God, I pray that fire will come from heaven and you see fire whoosh come down from heaven, you will be tempted to believe your experience over the Word of God. But let me tell you, whatever you experience, you must match that with the Word of God. 
It's only when your experience and God's Word match together that you can know that you, what you're experiencing is the truth. Revelation 12, verses 9 and 12 says, The great dragon, that Satan, was cast out of heaven. The serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Verse 12 says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, and woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. One-third of the angels of heaven chose to follow Satan in rebellion, and now they are working to bring the rest of the world, every man, woman, and child, down with them in uh, deception and destruction. Book of Peter warns us, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober and be vigilant. That means be wide awake. For your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion. And you can finish it. What does it say? That's right. The devil and his angels are bent on deceiving and destroying human beings. He is the father of lies and deceptions, and the reason it is important to understand what happens when you die is because the devil will seek to deceive and or destroy you. We need to know the truth because the truth will set us free. 2 Corinthians tells us, no wonder Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. I remember when I was in Australia going to Avondale, I was walking, I decided I was going to do a late night hike. And so I went, <laughs> I went off the campus and I started going down this trail and the deeper I went on this trail, it just felt oppressive. And so I thought to myself, I know what I'll do. I'll turn around and I'll bring a friend. So I went back to the dorm and I asked one of the guys if he wanted to go on a midnight hike. And he said, sure. So uh, we both started going. And on our way to the trail, you pass what was called the, uh, the sanitarium. And you know what they made at the sanitarium? Anybody heard of Wheat Bix? Yes. There, uh, there is nothing like the smell of wheat bix and the sound of kookaburras to wake up to. <laughs> uh, so we're hiking down this trail, and outside there's a worker. He's having a smoke break, and he stops us. And let me tell you, and specifically, I want to share this with the young people. God will be gracious to you at times and send the most unlikely people to warn you and stop you from going down paths. And when that happens, pause and pray. And consider, am I going down a safe path? So this guy stopped us and he said, hey guys, where are you going? We said, we're going for a midnight hike. And he said, uh, I wouldn't go if I were you. He said, that forest... That forest, there's a lot of shady stuff that happens in that forest. He says, there's people who have lost their lives there in that forest. He said, don't go. And as a uh, very self-confident college male, he said, don't worry, we'll be fine. And we kept on walking. And looking back, I should have listened to that guy. I should have not gone, but we kept on walking. Me and my friend, we walked. And by the way, we were both Christians. We were both prayer warriors. But we just kept on walking. And as we walked down the trail, it, we got deeper into the woods. It got darker. We turned a corner. And all of a sudden, he and I both froze in our tracks. There was footsteps that were walking all around us. We couldn't see it. I didn't know if it was an animal or a person, but it sounded... I mean, you just heard, you could hear this, and you know how you can kind of gauge how far something is? It, it sounded like it was about 10 feet out, 
maybe from me to that music stand, just going around us. And we were terrified. I thought to myself, I'm too scared to go back. And I don't know what to do to go forward. And, uh, and so I turned to him. I said, we need to pray. So we began to pray. We didn't pray those silent prayers. We prayed out loud. Lord Jesus, we need your help. Save us now. Please be with us. We don't know what's 10 feet away from us, but we need you to be with us. And we didn't stop praying. And as we were praying, we finally got enough courage to just start walking. And we prayed and walked and prayed and walked. And the entire, like, three or four miles, those footsteps continued to circle us. But they could only come so close. It seemed to me as if an invisible barrier was set up around me and my friend, and they could only come so close, like God had stationed His angels around us. You've read Psalms 34, haven't you? The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him and delivers them. And as we exited the forest, I mean literally exited the forest and stepped onto the college campus territory, the footsteps faded away. It's real, my friends, but I want you to know there is a power more powerful than the enemy. And He is there, God is there, if we call on Him uh, in those circumstances. What I want you to see today is a great deception that is being played on the entire world by a wicked angel who inhabits an invisible world within our own. He has told a lie to the human race from the very beginning. In Genesis 3, verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you will what? Not surely die. What did God say to the woman? In Genesis 3, 2 through 3, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat its fruit, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. God say, said, what would happen if we sinned? We would die. Satan said, if you sin, you will not die. And today, millions of people around the world hold one belief in common, regardless of religion, that the dead do not really die. Could it be that Satan has been successful in spreading the first lie from the Garden of Eden to the entire world? You will not surely die. So, Pastor, if ghosts are not our dead loved ones, but demons in disguise, and the Bible says that the dead sleep in their graves, what is the great hope of the Bible? If my mother or brother or friend or loved one is not in heaven, what is the hope? I'd like to give you the hope that Jesus gave Martha and Mary who sorrowed when their beloved brother Lazarus had died. What was the hope that Jesus gave them in their time of trouble? John chapter 11, verse 25. Read it with me. Let's read it together. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Notice, Jesus didn't say, Lazarus is in heaven. It's okay, Martha. It's okay, Mary. Don't sorrow. Don't be afraid. Lazarus is in heaven. Jesus didn't give that hope. Neither uh, did Jesus say, it's okay, Mary and Martha. Lazarus will come back and speak to you tonight. Or Lazarus will send you a message by leaving little notes in your drawers or shoes. Jesus didn't say that because he had something better. He said, Martha, turn your eyes upon me. Your brother is dead and you're sorrowing. Turn your eyes upon me. I am the resurrection and the life. And then Jesus gave an even better hope. He said to her, Martha, I'll give you the real hope that I will defeat death and I will bring Lazarus to life again in the flesh and blood. You tell me which is better, to have something that looks like your loved one visit you at night or to have your loved one raised to life again by Jesus. 
Think about this. If your loved one ones go to heaven when they die, why does the Bible say there must be a resurrection? There's no need for a resurrection if we're already in heaven, right? But if there is no resurrection, listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15. It says, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have what? Did you catch that? If there's no resurrection, then we have no hope of ever seeing the dead again. If there's no resurrection. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Understand today that there are many who have received comfort or comforted their own souls with the thought that their loved ones are in heaven. My brother, my mother, my father, my son, they're in heaven. But let me tell you that Jesus offers you a better hope, something better to hold on to, that you will see them again. Rosa was a little girl who lost her mother. And at the death of her mother, she was given a little necklace of plastic pearls. Well, before her mother died, she gave her a little necklace of plastic pearls. And it was a kind of a memory of her own mother, because her own mother used to always wear this necklace of real pearls. And so little Rosa, after her mother died, she refused to take off her necklace of plastic pearls. It reminded her of her mother. It gave her such comfort. She wore that necklace of plastic pearls everywhere. On the playground, she even went to sleep with, the, with that necklace. Uh, one day, her father called her and said, Rosa, I want, to, uh, I want to give you something. He said, but do you trust me? She said, of course I trust you, Daddy. Do you love me? Of course I love you, Daddy. Do you believe I love you? Yes. I'd like to ask you to give me your plastic pearls. No, Daddy. No. I can't give you my plastic pearls. You know that these plastic pearls have meant the world to me. Daddy, I've never taken them off. They remind me of Mommy. I will never give you my plastic pearls, honey, he said. Do you love me? Yes, Daddy. Do I love you? Yes. Do you trust me? Yes, Daddy. Give me your plastic pearls, honey. And trembling, little Rosa began lifting those plastic pearls off her necklace, off her neck. And she finally lifted it off and dropped it into her father's hand and went into a ball of tears. And then she felt her father putting something around her neck. She opened her eyes. It was her mother's real pearl necklace. And the joy, in that joy, she forgot about the plastic pearls. God has a better hope for us if we are willing to trust him. He's promised that he will come again. And when he comes, the one who is called the resurrection and the life will bring life to those who have passed away. Where are you looking right now? Who is the center of your hope? Who is providing you comfort and strength in this moment just now. Friends, I hope your eyes are centered on Jesus. This morning, I want to ask you, how many of you would like the real pearls that Jesus gives? How many of you this morning would like to say, Lord, I sorrow over those who I have lost, but I'm going to fix my eyes from this day forward on the resurrection and the life. I'm gonna fix it on Jesus and I'm going to look for the soon coming of Jesus. Let me pray for you just now. Let's bow our heads.
Gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for giving us the real pearls of truth that are laid out there in Scripture so clearly for us. I thank you for warning us and giving us truth. And I thank you most of all that Jesus has promised something so much better, that he's coming again and that we will see our loved ones again. I pray, Lord, for your blessing. I pray, Lord, that we can hold on to uh, what you have given to us as hope in your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would provide that comfort and that grace to each person here. Thank you, Lord, for the many ways that you speak to us. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.